um, yeah, we'll get started. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Boston MPO Unified Planning Work Program Committee meeting. Go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, I'll start by reading a few of the notices. Uh, first is the Notice of Non-Discrimination, uh, which reads that you are invited to participate in our transportation planning process, regardless of your race, color, national origin, including limited English proficiency, religion, creed, gender, ancestry, ethnicity, disability, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, veteran status or background. Um, the next slide is for virtual meeting guidelines, uh, which state that all participants will join the meeting with muted microphones. Uh, please rename yourself to include your first name, last name, and affiliation. Participants may mute and unmute themselves, uh, but please always remain muted unless actively speaking. To participate in the discussion, you can select the raise hand function by either clicking on the participants button at the bottom of the screen, and a window will pop up with a raise hand button at the bottom, or the reactions button in the toolbar, and the chair will then call on participants. If you're calling in from the phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. And if you have any technical difficulties, please contact Erin McGuire via the chat box by email at emaguire at ctps.org or by phone at 857-702-3681. Now I read the accessibility statement, which states that this meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with exceptions with the following standards, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1, Level AA Standards, and Revised Section 508 Standards. And again, if you have any um, requests for or require any additional accommodations to participate fully in the meeting, you can contact Erin McGuire of MPO staff at email uh, uh, E-M-A-G-U-I-R-E -E at ctps.org or by phone at 857-702-3681. Great, so with that, we'll move on to our first uh, agenda item, which is introductions. I'll go ahead and read the role here. So my name is Derek Cravat. I am the um, chair of the committee from MassDOT's Office of Transportation Planning. and. Uh, we'll move on to uh, MAPC. So Julia Wallers is going to represent MAPC um, on the UPWP committee. So I'm going to let Julia introduce herself. But I'm Eric Barassa, Director of Transportation at MAPC. Great. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Wallers, uh, Assistant Director of Transportation here at MAPC with Eric. And I'm excited to be joining this committee for 2024 and working with you all. Great. Thank you, Julia. Welcome. And likewise, Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate you joining. Uh, we'll move on to Town of Arlington. All right. Move on to Boston Transportation Department. Uh, I think that's me. Close enough. I'm Jim Fitzgerald with the BPDA still, um, representing the city of Boston. Oh, great. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Um, city of Framingham or Metro West region. All right. Um, swap region. We have Medway. Um, hello, it's now Rentham. Ah, uh, Rentham. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So My Rachel mistake. Benson. Rachel Benson here, representing Joe Botash, chair of the board of selectmen in Rentham. Excellent. Sorry about that, Rachel. And. Um, this is Dennis Giambetti from Metro West, oh. sorry. Oh, great. Hi, Dennis. Thank you. And thanks, Rachel. Noted that change on our, on our spreadsheet here. So welcome uh, to you as well uh, as, as a new committee member. Thank you for, for joining. Um, we have at-large city, city of Newton. Hi, this is David Kozis representing Mayor Fuller in the city of Newton. Great. Hi, David. Um, Trick uh, region, town of Norwood. Hi, uh, Tom O'Rourke from the town of Norwood, representing the Trick subregion. Great. Welcome, Tom. Do we have the inner core here, city of Somerville? Okay, not seeing anyone there. Um, Artac. Leonard. I wanted to get the advisor council here. 
Great. Hi, Len. And finally, MBTA Advisory Board. Don't think I see Amira here. So we'll call it at that. Um, all right. Did I miss any other members that are on? Don't believe so. Okay. All right. With that, we'll move on to our next item, which is public comments. Is there anyone present that would like to address the committee today uh, via public comment? Okay. Don't see any comments. If you do have any comments during the meeting, you can use the chat function or feel free to raise your hand and um, we'll be sure to call on you. So the next item is an action item for the October 26, 2023 uh, UPWP committee meeting summary. I'll ask for a motion and second to approve uh, that summary. I'll make a motion to approve the summary. Thank you. Is there a second? David goes us all second that motion. All right. Thank you both. Is there any uh, feedback or any comments on the minutes or summary? All right. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and call the roll. Uh, Massa OTP. Uh, yes. Uh, Julie Wallers. The Wallers, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dennis Giambetti. I'll abstain. I wasn't at the meeting. Okay. Jim Fitzgerald. Yeah, I might need to do that. That's why I sorry I didn't oh. speak up. I well, oh, also that's... wasn't at the meeting in October. But if Eric's okay. on, just want to okay. be clear about sure. that. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, we can um, we can just treat it as, as an abstain. And same with Dennis, that, that's fine. Um, Jim Fitzgerald. Um, I wasn't involved, but I can't say, I say yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think the first four here, maybe folks weren't here, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it to go through the process. Uh, next I have Rachel Benson. Uh, abstain. Yep. Okay, thank you, Rachel. David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. And Leonard Diggins. Diggins, yes. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll move on to our next item, uh, which I believe is a summary of the next UPWP um, timeline for federal fiscal year 2025. <clears throat> I'll turn it over to Sri Lanka. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining uh, this committee meeting. Uh, just need a quick second. Uh, next slide, please, Erin. Um, so today I will be presenting the draft timeline for the development of the federal fiscal year 2025 UPWP. And at the end of my presentation, I will request that you vote to approve this timeline. Uh, similar to last year, um, we have set an internal goal of obtaining endorsement of the UPWP earlier this year. Um, this year, the goal is to endorse by the end of June to bring us closer in alignment with MassDOT's internal deadline. Um, a good deal of internal work has already begun on the UPWP. We released a survey soliciting study and project ideas back in the fall to collect concepts for both the discrete studies program and the MPO's ongoing work programs. Um, we additionally attended meetings of all 13 MAPC subregions to discuss their needs and how the MPO can support the needs of its municipalities. Internally, we have started drafting chapters and chapter outlines. And importantly, we've begun some preliminary work program planning activities to set ourselves up for a successful document development process down the line. Next slide, please. Um, so onto the timeline itself, um, please refer to the handout on the meeting calendar for a more detailed version of the timeline on the screen. This is a little small, but uh, we have a PDF posted on the meeting calendar for today. Um, so I'll just read through it briefly. Um, in February of 2024, um, the survey will close on February 1st. Um, we will stop accepting sort of new study ideas at that point. Um, and we will start developing the universe of proposed studies. Um, this year, it is going to look a little bit different um, compared to previous years as we focus more of our efforts within the MPO's ongoing work programs. 
So you may notice some differences in how we present the universe to this committee and to the advisory council just externally. Um, so just, I guess, be on the lookout for that. Um, we will also begin those internal discussions on study ideas and on our work program planning. In March, we'll present the universe to the advisory council and the UPWP committee. Um, we'll continue those internal discussions um, and we'll also have our preliminary program budgets announced, um, which will include the budget for the discrete studies program. Um, though we don't have that information yet at this point, we excuse me, anticipate that the discrete studies program will be funded at a similar level as last year, which was $150,000. In April of 2024, uh, discussions on the universe will continue um, and we'll determine the exact funding amounts for our studies and the uh, budgets for programs. Um, in May, we'll announce a final list of studies that we'll be funding and we'll also be presenting the draft federal fiscal year 2025 UPWP to the MPO and its committees, including this one, uh, requesting release for public comment. In June, we'll present the uh, final kind of UPWP and request endorsement. Um, and the goal is by the end of June, we'll have it endorsed um, and kind of complete to send to ODP. Um, so like I said, the universe is, might look a little bit different this year than it has in previous years, but as we develop it and as we know more, we'll be coming back to this committee um, on a fairly regular basis. Um, in previous years, we've done a meeting every two weeks between February and April or so with some variation thereabouts. Um, so once the survey closes and we begin developing that universe, we may return to a meeting cadence of every two weeks, but I'll leave that discussion and decision to you all and to the chair to kind of figure out what would work best. Um, so with that, I will request that this committee vote to approve the development timeline that's presented for the Federal Fiscal Year 2025 UPWP, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Shalaka. Uh, First, before opening up for, or before asking for a vote, I'll, I'll open it up to any questions folks have. Any questions? Okay, I don't see any hands or anyone jumping in. So I, I think this timeline looks good. Julia, appreciate it. Sorry, I have a quick question. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, go ahead, Julia. I was yeah. looking for the raise hand course, button yeah. on oh, Zoom. Yeah. No when problem. you say um, soliciting study ideas, is that the online survey that's like a one question, submit your ideas? Is that the only method by which study ideas are solicited or is there some direct outreach? So you can submit your ideas uh, through that survey. You can also email me directly. Um, that is the sort of streamlined method that we have for soliciting ideas at this point. Mm -hmm. And how many ideas do you typically get? Um, last year we got 76. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember exactly how many we had the previous year. Um, so far we don't have a ton. So I will put in a little bit of a plug to submit some ideas. We don't have a ton right now, so we don't have a whole lot to discuss, which mm -hmm. can be good and bad in its own way. But um, generally we receive about 60 to 70, and then we end up consider see more seriously considering i guess it ranges between 30 and 50 um but mm -hmm. it, i think it really depends on the year okay and it's it was a google form right that was like a couple of months ago sent out um it's a qualtrics survey yeah oh qualtrics okay yeah a survey thank you any other questions Don't see any. So with that, I'll ask for a motion and second to approve the timeline here for the UPWP uh, uh, for 2025 as presented. Rachel Benson, I'll make that motion. Thank you. And I see Tom with a raised hand. Uh, Tom Bent, I'll uh, second that motion. All right, thank you everyone. Motion having been made and seconded, I'll call the roll. Um, Pass that OTP. Uh, yes. Julia Wallers. Julia Wallers, yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Jim Fitzgerald, yes. Yeah. Dennis Giambetti. 
Dennis Chimbet, yes. Rachel Benson. Rachel Benson, yes. David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. And Leonard Dickens. You can just. Uh, and Tom Bent. Sorry, Tom. Tom Bent, yes. Excellent. I think that's everyone. Not seeing anyone else who's joined. So, okay. Or, uh, oh, okay. Never mind. Okay. Perfect. So that passes. And thanks again, Sri Lanka. A really helpful presentation um, on the timeline. Uh, and the next item we have here is a presentation uh, from Sam Taylor on performance-based planning and programming. So I'll turn it over to Sam. Thank you, Derek. And I believe we have a few slides today. Great. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Taylor. I am the manager of performance-based planning and programming, uh, and I'm here uh, to share with you a brief overview of the performance-based planning program, uh, and also to ask uh, for your feedback on how this program could be a better resource uh, for this committee, for the board, uh, for other stakeholders, and the region at large. Uh, next slide, please. So what is performance-based planning and programming? Um, the PBPP, uh, the acronym, process, uh, is something that all state DOTs and MPOs are required to do. It has been a federal, federal certification requirement since 2016. Uh, and what this essentially means is that uh, multimodal transportation systems must use metrics to guide their planning decisions. The Boston Region MPO is somewhat unique in that it has a full-time uh, performance-based planning and programming manager, which is me, uh, which allows for more robust reporting and collaboration with our planners. Um, so there are three phases to this process, planning, investing, and monitoring and reporting. Uh, the US DOT requires MPOs to establish uh, performance targets in six key policy areas, and those MPOs are to report on progress toward achieving those targets. Um, note that these are the performance targets um, that the board adopts usually each winter, with some of these being annual targets, some being two-year targets, and some being longer range four-year targets. Also, uh, depending on the performance area, these performance targets are often set in collaboration with MASTA, and in the case of transit-related targets, the region's three RTAs. Um, so by establishing performance targets, the MPO can uh, both plan and invest towards these goals and set targets in accountable, transparent ways. Um, the third phase, monitoring and reporting, revol involves review um, and reporting of, on these outcomes of MPO investment decisions uh, with respect to performance measures and targets and determining what framework or, or strategy adjustments uh, we feel are needed. Um, one of the avenues for reporting is the performance dashboard, which will be under construction soon. Uh, and also, as required by federal agencies, these performance targets uh, and the progress toward those targets are incorporated into the MPO certification documents, including the TIP and the Long Range Transportation Plan. Um, additionally, several uh, performance measures were reported also in the needs assessment of the last uh, LRTP. Next slide, please. Uh, currently, there are six performance areas in which uh, MPOs must establish performance targets. Um, those are roadway safety, transit safety, transit asset management, travel time reliability, uh, bridge and pavement condition, and uh, congestion management and air quality, which is CMAC. Um, a lot of acronyms there. Um, the first three of the aforementioned targets are required to be updated every year and will uh, actually be addressed in the next few weeks with the full board. Uh, the other three performance target areas work on two and four year cycles and will be addressed next winter. Additionally, uh, beginning later this year, MPOs must for the first time establish targets on greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Uh, that, that new development was announced around Thanksgiving. Um, and while these targets are always always adopted by the voting MPO board members. In future years, the MPO is working to incre increase engagement efforts uh, in relation to its target setting, especially in the area of roadway safety. 
Another related activity, um, excuse me, just clicked on the wrong thing here. Uh, another related activity occurring this year is the construction of the new performance dashboard. Uh, the new dashboard will be organized by uh, performance area, which is in alignment with the guidance of uh, federal officials. And this tool intends to provide the board and other related stakeholders with a new resource, um, which, uh, which the board can use to visualize transportation performance in the region, um, especially as it relates to adopting new targets. Um, and while the post of LRTP manager is currently vacant, um, uh, the performance-based planning and programming manager will work this year uh, with the future LRTP manager and also the MPO activities staff uh, to explore opportunities for more frequent and in-depth reporting outside of certification documents and the dashboard. Um, this past summer, the LRTP's needs assessment um, provided a, a true plethora of information in the form of charts, figures, maps, um, and, and more. Um, and while the long range transportation plan and needs assessment are produced every four years, uh, there may be opportunities for this program uh, to produce more frequent reporting uh, on a smaller scale than the needs assessment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so let's move to discussion. Um, now that you've heard a little bit uh, about performance-based planning and programming, I would like to turn the conversation over to the committee. Um, there are a few questions here that you see on the slide. Uh, are there particular performance areas that you are interested in, named or unnamed in this presentation? Um, what I really mean are, are more like broad policy areas such as safety, congestion, uh, and air quality, uh, things like that. Um, are there elements of this program that you would like to see staff build on? Um, are there types, styles, or increments of reporting that you would like to see this program consider? Uh, perhaps there's a dashboard or a reporting tool at another organization or agency that you have seen recently, um, and you could see uh, our MPO borrowing from there. Um, so yes, at, at this time, I'd like to um, uh, welcome your feedback and, and just thank you for listening for a few minutes. Great. Thank you, Sam. Uh, yeah, open it up to any members that have any thoughts on these questions, any reactions. Eric. Yeah, so so Sam, we're gonna um there there is a new performance-based measure, right, recently adopted that is about GHG. And we also um we've also for like a decade or so been also incorporating GHG sort of into our planning process per I think the Global Warming Solutions Act. And I'm just wondering, um, do, you, do you have a sense of how that, will, will anything change or how does that, how will that happen? <laughs> uh, what is that gonna look like? Yeah, so for MAPC, I must be honest, I don't know exactly how this will affect um, the MAPC side, but for the for um, the CTPS side, essentially the the, the basic process is that in February, um, and Derek, correct me if I'm wrong, in February, uh, MassDOT and state DOTs are required to adopt um, uh, baseline level targets on greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions. And then within 180 days, similar to uh, other performance areas, within 180 days, um, MPOs receive that information from the state, um, and they work with um, uh, MPOs within their urbanized area, similar to how we we uh, we form CMAC requirements um, and form our own targets within 180 days of that that February date. So um, I will be coming back to uh, to the board probably in July or August with these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just yeah just. That's that's exactly correct, Sam. And our official deadline is February first for the initial, and it's a it's a four year target, and the target is reported as a percentage change in tailpipe emissions between twenty twenty two, which is the reference year, and I think twenty twenty five. Um, so it's like over that period, uh, the decrease in GHGs um, we'd be looking to see. And um, Jules Williams uh, from Mass.OTP OTP is the sustainable transportation manager. He really took is taking the lead on the actual kind of target setting for it, 
um, because it's going to be, I think, in line with what we're reporting in the clean energy and climate plan and the, the larger state um, GHG goals. We don't want a separate federal goal and like a separate state goal. So they're kind of, I think, using the data that's prescribed in the federal rulemaking to kind of back back into um, our, our existing state goal for GHGs. And then, like Sam said, that'll be presented to the MPOs. And we're actually presenting at the Mass Start MARPA meeting on January 31st, um, more about the process for that measure and what we're doing for it. Okay. So that'll incorporate both like, like um, what we're anticipating for VMT growth and and transit, you know, kind of transit mode share and everything into kind of what is our goal, right? Yeah, yeah. The I, I believe the the data that they're using does use VMT. There's there's a formula that involves it's like FHWA's fuels and fash system, which I think is. Um, it, it it's it's like VMT um, multiplied by like the actual like numbers of vehicles they think are using different fuel types and and things like that. So it's 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 a pretty involved measure. But yeah, and then I think the the target does that we're setting at the state level does account for all of what you mentioned, like the larger state goals around like transit and even I think electric vehicle adoption. And I. I think there's just a sense that like it's it's definitely an ambitious target. Like I I don't know. I, I think this is all pending like our leadership reviews too. But it's I think kind of known that it's like you know probably not not necessarily achievable. It's just to be consistent with the state one, and it reflects our kind of more ambitious climate strategy um, going forward. So it's um, yeah. Well, I, I'm looking forward to that. So I'm, yeah. I appreciate that update. I'm glad I'm glad that that's happening. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you, Eric. Rachel. Um, hi, I see Rachel Bunsen to representing Rentham uh, Swap. So what is your work or your, I see in here, it's like uh, the mobility and reliability, reliability, access and connectivity. Would that include how, um, you know, like buses are connecting with, um, you know, local commuter rails or vice versa, that type of things, bus networks, as well as I know in our area, we have the Gatra Go program, which is, I think other people are doing that micro transit, but how to expand on that, number one. Number two, are you also maybe looking at as a lot of communities are now uh, coming in with their MBTA, zoning districts, um, are you looking at how you can expand your service to those areas? And I, again, you know, uh, shameless plug, you know, type of a, we're an adjacent community. So I think of that, it's top of our, in my area of the suburbs, uh, we don't have, you know, commuter rail within our borders, but um, we're going to need to find a way to get these people to these commuter rails or rapid transit. Um, and so, uh, just hoping that's somewhere in a plan somewhere or somebody's thinking about studying that as these districts are starting to be approved, um, how to get people from place to place with reduced parking requirements. That was a big question. Is that part of what you're looking at? <laughs> um, hmm, how do I put this? Yes and no, in that um, at least within this, this program of uh, um, of performance reporting, um, there are some transit safety and transit asset measures um, that we're required to report on um, every every year and every couple of years. Um, however, uh, Betsy Harvey's uh, program, the Transportation Equity Program, focuses more on uh, what what you were describing, which is more um, transit access, not so much um, other transit measures that that this this program. Um, reports on and studies, um, as well as I believe Ethan LaPointe is on this call. Um, uh, uh, Ethan is the is the manager of the TIP program, which you may know. Um, and uh, so I would say uh, Betsy and Ethan's programs are, are, are really more the ones that, that focus on expanding transit access and, and transit services. And Julie, I see you have a hand up. Did you want to speak to the work MAPC is doing around 3A implementation or is, is it something else? If I don't want to put you on the spot if it's not about that. 
Oh, I mean, I can certainly speak to that. I mean, my question was, I was building off of what Rachel had said and really want, would love to see a land use element connected here with relation to 3A and the, the extreme focus that's going to be, particularly for the transit adjacent communities over this next year and tying in something to do with transit supportive land use and parking measures that have outcomes on GHG, um, on mode shift, all these things that, you know, we talk about in a transit lens, but really bridging into that housing and land use realm to set an example for you know what the state's doing on with 3a and sort of bringing municipalities to the table in a new way to think about how housing transportation and land use work together and i'm not familiar enough with the performance-based um planning and programming to know what that would look like within this but i wanted to make sure to elevate that in the conversation um and then, yeah, to answer your question, I mean, MAPC is, we just released an updated resource page about 3A with some really extensive and thorough FAQs. And we're looking at some modeling tools to sort of like plug in if this, then, you know, if you were to zone for this amount or include this amount of parking um, or this level of transit access, this would be the result, um, as well as continued building some curriculum to help communities build support and do some sort of myth busting and create more buy-in um, for this work. Awesome. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, like, I guess, sort of point to be thinking about this in the context of performance-based planning. Like if there was some kind of like baseline, like here's how many, um, you know, multifamily um, units or, rental units or, you know, exist within the required sort of perimeter of transit stations. And then like, where do, what, what is that at currently? And what, what do we need to, you know, uh, you know, some kind of process to analyze, like, how does it look to, you know, what, what a goal might be or what, you know, what we might be able to do or areas in need of most assistance and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting interesting question that might be a good like upwp task or something like that so <laughs> i don't know if folks aren't already thinking about tracking that kind of information um in the region all right anything else cool well thanks sam do you feel like you got what you need out of this group here do you have any other questions or anything else you're looking for? Um, no, thank you all. I, I will let you um, proceed with the agenda. All right. Great. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for the presentation. We'll move on to the next presentation, which is from Judy Taylor on F fiscal year 2024 climate resilience and air quality programs. I'll hand it over to Judy. Great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Judy Taylor. For those of you I haven't met, um, I'm the Boston Region MPO's Climate Resilience and Air Quality Program Manager. And similar to Sam, I'm just here to talk to you all about my programs and looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, next slide, please. Ooh, next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just as a bit of an overview of the two programs, um, the Climate Resilience Program was established in 2021 to explore ways to expand the Boston Region MPO's consideration of climate change and resilience. Um, help to prepare the region's transportation infrastructure for a change in climate and consider ways that we can ensure the projects that the MPO selects for funding are able to withstand extreme weather events. Um, I've been with the MPO for around a year and a half and I'm the first person to manage this program full time. So it's come a long way since then, but it's, it's still growing and very much open to your feedback. Um, and since the only federal requirement for MPOs surrounding climate resilience is to consider it in our planning activities, um, there's a lot of flexibility in exactly how we do that. Um, and I'll go into a bit more of the specifics after this. Um, but the air quality program, more formally known as air quality conformity determination and support, the less fun name, um, is a bit more concrete in its requirements. So this program supports the demonstration of compliance with air quality conformity, meaning um, us demonstrating that our planning documents the TIP, the LRTP, um, that those conform to the EPA's requirements that federal transportation investments must not cause or contribute to air quality violations. Uh, the program also supports the annual greenhouse gas reporting required by the state's Global Warming Solutions Act and provides emissions estimates for all projects included in the TIP. 
In general, the program also supports efforts to understand regional air quality and emissions concerns and supports the development of air quality analyses like those done for the last LRTP update. Uh, next slide, please. So just a few of the actions planned for FFY24 within the Climate Resilience Program. Um, support for the Environmental Engagement Discrete Study. This is an ongoing UPWP funded study that is seeking to improve the MPO's relationships with regional environmental stakeholders. Um, and that includes advocacy groups, nonprofits, uh, municipal officials, and peer agencies. This is sort of an area of engagement that we found to be lacking, um, specifically the MPO's engagement on environmental issues. So we're really excited about using this study to bring new groups to the table um, and improve the way that we consider environmental issues, including climate resilience and air quality. Uh, for re-evaluation of resilience tip criteria, um, staff held a workshop back in the fall with environmental stakeholders um, and other agency peers to sort of collabor collaboratively reevaluate the environmental tip criteria that we use to uh, prioritize projects for funding on the tip, since these were criteria that really hadn't gotten a big refresh in a few years. Um, this workshop and the feedback we got from stakeholders resulted in a pretty significant rewrite of the metrics that we use to evaluate and sort of encourage a stronger consideration of resilience in project design. Um, and being that we just wrapped up TIP applications, we're really excited to see how these changes may have manifested in the applications we received. Uh, next to sort of help TIP applicants and municipal planners meet these new criteria, um, and also just in an effort to be more transparent about our scoring process and the data that we use, staff put together an interactive online resource containing resilience and adaptation guidance for transportation planning. Um, I have the resource linked here in the slides and can definitely share this afterwards. Um, and the goal is to sort of keep this resource uh, updated as we hear from planners what is and isn't helpful for them in filling out their applications. Uh, staff are also currently working on a coastal flood mobility analysis, which seeks to test the application of the Massachusetts Coast Flood Risk Model, or MCFRM, um, on the newly developed TDM23, which is our travel demand model. The goal is sort of to understand both the potential utilizations of TDM23, um, as well as get a sense of how mobility patterns may be disrupted by various coastal flood events and where critical pathways uh, may need to be strengthened in these sort of emergency situations. Uh, aside from that, the program also supports regular coordination on resilience with our agency partners, including the T, MAPC, and others. Uh, we're also currently working on a multi-year vision for the program. So this is something that we're hoping will help shape and grow the program um, instead of on a year-by-year -year basis, something a little bit more long-term. And last, staff will be preparing for the adoption of a vulnerability assessment framework, which will help identify regional climate concerns in transportation and potentially fill gaps in information that's already kind of being um, circulated in the region. Uh, next slide, please. So a few actions planned this year for the air quality program. Um, again, support for the environmental engagement discrete study. This goes across the programs. Um, as the study is seeking to establish connections with um, EJ groups and other organizations concerned with air quality and emissions in addition to the climate resilience piece. Uh, staff are providing support for the air quality components of the equity program baseline equity dashboard. Staff will be performing air quality analyses um, this spring to determine project eligibility for CMAC funding, as well as to demonstrate compliance with greenhouse gas reporting requirements. Uh, for this year's tip. Uh, staff, like Sam mentioned earlier in his presentation um, from the air quality program, will be supporting Sam in the performance-based planning program to support the adoption of the new federal greenhouse gas performance measure, um, which again, as Sam mentioned, requires a declining four-year emissions target for the region. And last, uh, staff have and will be exploring how to utilize various air quality data sources, um, such as EPA's EJ screen, purple air and satellite data to better our understanding of regional air quality concerns and help us um, inform planning decisions on our side. Next slide, please. 
So just to wrap up, I have a few bullets on work that these programs are gearing up for beyond FFY24. Um, definitely open to feedback here. So both programs are seeking to leverage the new stakeholder relationships and engagement platforms established through the Environmental Engagement Discrete Study to help support our planning activities, including um, potential project initiation, development of any specific resources and tools folks may need, um, and identification of discrete study needs. Definitely we'll be plugging the UPWP survey with the new folks that we're meeting. Um, the resilience program in particular, I think I mentioned this earlier, will be looking to adopt a vulnerability assessment framework over the next few years, um, again, to help us identify MPO specific resiliency needs and help us prioritize funding in specific key areas. Uh, both programs will evaluate the success of the modified LRTP goals of resilience and clean air and healthy communities that were adopted by Destination 2050. And last, um, staff are planning to look for ways to grow the air quality program to hopefully initiate more discrete analyses or be a little bit more flexible um, with what that program looks into, sort of in addition to meeting the regular federal and state requirements that it's really focused on in the past. Uh, next slide, please. So that's it from me. Um, my email is invisible on this slide, so I'll, I'll post it in the chat if that's helpful. Um, very much looking forward to hearing your feedback. And if there's anything in particular you're interested in seeing out of these programs, um, I'd love to hear it. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Judy. Any questions? <clears throat> Had. I had a question on, um, it, it's great to see that you're pulling in air quality information into the um, equity dashboard and um, and things like that. I was I was just curious, like, yeah, what what kinds of data are you thinking? You mentioned some data sources, I think, on that same side. Are you are you thinking like those same sources will be kind of integrated with the uh, equity and access to uh, destinations kind of uh, uh, dashboard or what kind of data are you thinking of pulling in? Yeah, so the purpose of the equity dashboard is really to show the difference in exposure or access, in this case, it's exposure to air quality concerns between equity and non-equity populations. Um, so we really wanted to use purple air. If, if anyone doesn't know what those are, they're basically like specific on-site monitors that give you real-time air quality data. Mm. But we just found that we couldn't extrapolate that out in a way that was meaningful to make comparisons since they're so site-specific. Mm. Um, so what we ended up using for that work is EJ screen has census tract level percentiles for a few of the air quality metrics. And we were also spending some time on Google Earth Engine satellite data for nitrous dioxide. Um, but we were having trouble getting those numbers to be meaningful in a public health sense. So mm -hmm. what we have right now is EJ screen, which is great for connecting back to what's healthy and unhealthy. And then we have um, plans to display the satellite data in a relative exposure sense, but not make any connections to the health piece since we just couldn't get to that point, if that makes sense. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, sounds good. Yeah, I know that for our long range plan, we're looking at pulling in data. I think it's from one of the federal tools was actually pretty useful. I had like traffic proximity and estimated like particulate matter in certain, I think it was at the census block group level. Um, so it sounds similar to what you're doing, which is great and, um, definitely a, a valuable, um, valuable analysis. Other questions, thoughts, anything else? Yeah, Rachel. Um, hello again. Um, does this, would any of this work sort of Again, I'm thinking of, you know, in the suburbs, we're getting a lot, we have a lot of, um, you know, warehouse distribution facilities that are coming in and, you know, we try and have things in to require them to have like plugins so they're not idling and, you know, anti-idling law and everything like that. But I mean, that's how we get up. That's how our, our commerce goes back and forth. Freight is traveled a lot by um, trucks. Is there anything, or I guess, does this work with, on how to get more electric trucks, if that's even a thing, electric freight vehicles, uh, you know, on the roads to help with that air quality. Um, just, I don't know if that even is in your realm. I apologize if it's not. 
No, it, it shockingly um, is. <laughs> We're <laughs> wrapping up a study right now about the air quality impacts of freight and potential avenues for decarbonization. So that's definitely relevant. The study in particular is focused on um, the area just north of Boston and like East Boston, Chelsea and Revere, but it's it's definitely has applications elsewhere. Um, with the air quality piece, we basically did a literature review and stakeholder interviews to see where we're at with transitioning to lower carbon methods. So whether that's battery electric trucks or lower emission vehicles or shifting freight delivery from carbon emitting modes to something more clean, like it's basically an overview of the possibilities and a little bit of a testing the waters of how people in that area are feeling about those solutions. So that's, that's to come. I think we're presenting on that at the next MPO meeting. So it'll be very um, relevant. And if, you know, happy to answer any more questions specifically about that study. Um, but with like emissions estimates and reporting, that's more specifically to like the projects that we provide funding for. Um, it just so happens that we had a discrete study specifically related to freight recently. Thanks, Judy. And Rachel, any other questions? All right, I don't see any, so thank you. Great job, great presentations, both Judy and Sam, appreciate it. Um, we'll move on to our next item, which is members items. Are there any members items to uh, report? All right, seeing none, I, I don't have any either. We'll move on to our next item, which is next meeting. Um, Sri Lanka, I think this is yeah TBD right now. Uh, I know you're you had that schedule. The survey closes February first, and then do you think at the next meeting we'll kind of go over a draft of ideas, or what's your thought on on the sort of next next meeting? Yeah, I think the next meeting will probably aim for like mid February, um, and I'll be presenting um, the universe of proposed studies. Um, right. I think we're gonna do it a little differently from last year. I don't think I'll be presenting the raw universe. If you remember, that was ended up being about like 76 proposals and it was um, it, it was a lot of studies to go through in one meeting, I think. Um, so we will come back to this committee probably in mid-February with the universe that we'll be kind of disseminating as our one product. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, yeah, Steve. Yeah, I think it might be helpful when we get the list if they kind of got kind of categorized, like which are old projects that we, you know, scored well but didn't get to, other projects that we that were done that we realized there's like a part two to the project, and uh, some maybe we knew there was a part two to it, uh, or others we didn't know until we got going, or that we just didn't have the funds to really do the extent we wanted to. So if we could get uh, a list of those first at the beginning and then categorize as to, uh, you know, these are all projects and, and what's their status, uh, I think that would be helpful before we get to all these uh, new ones. So that, like a list from a pre like the previous year? Well, we don't, okay. but look at the list from the previous year and categorize them as to, okay, here's something scored well, but we just didn't have enough funding for it. Here's something that we definitely found as we were doing it or, or knew it as we were doing it, that there's gonna be a part two to it. And uh, other things like that, that uh, uh, projects that were just almost selected, but weren't selected last time. And I think those are the ones we should be looking at first and thinking about first. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Yeah, because I know there was a handful that were like more appropriate for maybe an existing program. So like those ones probably don't need to be on the list, but the ones that are eligible or I guess appropriate for the discrete study funding. Yeah, that sounds like that that would that would be great to to have summarized. Yeah. Okay. Uh Len. Well, I was just thinking maybe I should just save this for an advisory council meeting. You know, so like even if uh, 
even if you don't present <laughs> the raw universe, I can tell you the uh, uh, the people who really care in the advisory council are going to want to see uh, that universe. You know, so you can make it available uh, even without a formal presentation. That'd be great. All right. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Um, yeah, the only, only other thing I'll say on next meeting is it's it's possible we, we may have to have a meeting if, if I, I'm checking with our federal partners on an item that um, is related to a potential contract amendment that is it's just like a high level potential preview just to put on folks radar if, if you do hear from us about that. It's possible we'll have to meet in the coming weeks to, um, to uh, look at a potential UPWP amendment adding some some funding to the contract for uh, CTPS, but more administrative. Um, it would just be following our process, but we'll be in touch as, as we hear from our federal partners um, on that process piece. Um, I don't have anything else, so I don't see any hands. My last call here, but don't see any, so. Uh, oh you, yeah, of course, go ahead, Julia. Yeah. Can you resend the link to the Qualtrics survey? Just send that around to the committee for the study yeah. ideas. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. So with that, I'll ask for a motion and second to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn for my first meeting. Thank you. Your second. I'll make a second to adjourn from Julia's first meeting. Yeah. All right. Thank you both. I think without that in the record. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> put it in the record. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks, we'll all. Be in touch for your meeting. Bye.